Oh, hello. This little module is going to be concerned with some materials, some uh, inert gases, molecules, ionic solids, and a family called network covalent compounds, and arranging them according to increasing melting or boiling points. Now, over here on the right, I have an arrowhead saying higher melting and boiling points. These materials over here melt at extremely high temperatures. This family over here to the far right are called network covalent compounds, and we've seen a couple with the allotropes of carbon. There aren't too many compounds that fall into this category. Some are diamond, graphite, and quartz. And there are a few others. Diamond and graphite are pure carbon and have melting points that are estimated to be about 3,600 degrees C. Diamond is pure carbon. Graphite is pure carbon. And these both have melting points that are near 3,600 degrees centigrade. Now quartz, I brought in a little chunk of quartz here. People might be familiar with this. It's been used in watches and crystal radios. It's also nice to put out on a counter or make into some kind of bookend. You have quartz. Quartz melts at a very, very high temperature. It's called a network covalent compound. It's made out of silicon and oxygen. Go ahead and write this. Silicon and oxygen. These have something in common. They are covalently bonded together. I'll hold up that little model of a diamond structure again. We have sharing of electrons. You could think of this as being molecular in the sense that we have nonmetals sharing electrons, so we have covalent bonds. But they're not truly molecular because they form a three-dimensional, or in the case of graphite, one could argue two-dimensional sheet structures of covalent held atoms. Now, in order to melt these, you need to break all of these bonds. So there's where the network comes into play. A very unique family of compounds. Let's switch and go way over to the left side of this. Things that do not have high melting boiling points, as a matter of fact, very, very low. For example, a few of the inert gases I'll go ahead and list. Helium, neon, argon, through radon. These gases have very little attractive nature between them. One helium atom is not well attracted to another helium atom. We don't look at something like helium and say that it has a permanent dipole. It's not a polar atom. At any given moment, we could look at one and say, well, there's going to be dispersion forces. Let me make a note here, dispersion forces. Accounting for the slight attraction between these atoms. Also in this category are nonpolar molecules. For example, oxygen and nitrogen gas that combined make up about 99% of our atmosphere. These are nonpolar small molecules. We cannot assign a positive or a negative end to these molecules. So we have dispersion forces. A nitrogen molecule showing perhaps like a triple bond, a sigma and a couple of pi bonds. Next, a little bit higher in temperature for melting and boiling points would be our polar molecules. For example, let me hold the model up for CH3F. And I'm going to write this down on the board as being CH4 and then make a correction. Carbon in the center, four hydrogens. But what I've done is replace one of the hydrogens with a fluorine to make it into a polar molecule. It's commonly used as a refrigerant. Put a fluorine at the top. Carbon is tetrahedral, sp3 hybridized. Bond angles are ideally 109.5 degrees. The fluorine's causing the hydrogens to creep up a little bit. But we have a positive and a negative end to this molecule. I'm going to make a note for an arrow here. The arrowhead is positive. The tail, I put a little hash mark here, perhaps representing a positive sign. The arrowhead is negative. So we have ourselves a true dipole. The interaction here would be one molecule with another molecule, and there is an attraction. We would not expect these molecules to go head to head, perhaps something like this orientation where the negative portion of this molecule is attracted to the positive portion of that molecule, and vice versa, positive end, 
negative and a nice interaction. We refer to these as being dipole, dipole forces, more specifically intermolecular forces. Molecules that exhibit hydrogen bonding are next. Molecules that exhibit hydrogen bonding. The criteria here is, as the name implies, we need hydrogen to be present. Hydrogen needs to be bonded directly to an electronegative element such as oxygen or hydrogen can be bonded directly to a nitrogen or hydrogen bonded directly to the extreme electronegative fluorine. Now the phenomena occurs like this. I'm going to use water as a nice example. Water is a boomerang. Water is bent. Oxygen has two lone pairs of electrons up here if we consider its Lewis dot structure. Negative portion of the molecule, positive portion of the molecule. Now let's review for just a moment. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that this molecule exhibits dispersion. It has electrons, so at any given time they're not well balanced. But that's minor compared to the permanent dipole nature of water. So water is a polar molecule. It's going to exhibit dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. However, there's something else going on that's more dominant here, and that is that water has hydrogen bonding. The oxygen bonded directly to the hydrogen. I'm going to do a little board work and show you this theory. I'm going to incompletely draw a water molecule. We have oxygen in the center. It's bent, two lone pairs of electrons, a couple of hydrogens. Now on the board, I'm going to represent the bonding electrons as a pair of electrons. and I'm not going to put them at the center. I'm going to insinuate that oxygen is pulling that pair of electrons towards it, electronegativity. And again, oxygen is pulling electron density towards it. We might see a nice three-dimensional colored rendering in our textbook or an owl of what the electron density in this molecule looks like. But the effect is oxygen is electronegative end of the molecule. We have positive down here at the bottom. Now the effect of having the electrons pulled away from the hydrogens in these bonds is that hydrogen's feeling rather electropositive. It's going to seek out electrodensity on a neighboring water molecule. I brought a mar water molecule up near it. For example, here's our water molecule on top. Here's one coming in here. Our hydrogen bond is formed between the hydrogen on one water molecule and the oxygen on another. Let me go ahead and label this with a dotted line and hydrogen bonding. This is not as strong as a covalent bond. However, this is really a significant interaction. Water is said to have outstanding hydrogen bonding. We have the electronegative oxygen bonded directly to the hydrogen and we're going to form hydrogen bond holding water molecules near each other, holding them tight. Not a true covalent bond but a significant interaction. Water is said to have excellent hydrogen bonding also because we have two hydrogens going out and oxygen has two lone pairs of electrons insinuating that perhaps another hydrogen bond could form here. Two hydrogen bonds in, two hydrogen bonds out. Underneath uh, hydrogen bonding, let's list water and also alcohols. Alcohols. Alcohols are a family of organic compounds, meaning carbon containing, in which we have an OH, just like in water, OH, but the oxygen must be bonded to a carbon. For example, the ethanol molecule. We have our alcohol group, OH, bonded directly to a carbon. Ethanol looks like a dog. There's a little poodle tail, a little head up here, and it's got two carbons in it. Ethanol.
ethanol boils at a pretty high temperature for its molecular weight. It boils at approximately 78 degrees centigrade. Here, water, lighter, less mass, and it boils higher than the alcohol because of the excellent hydrogen bonding two in and two out. Water boils at 100, which is insane for such a small molecule, but it's a tribute to the effect of hydrogen bonding. And I would like to hold up a molecule here and ask you to examine it for a moment and tell me what intermolecular forces are present. We've looked at three intermolecular forces. We've looked at dispersion, which occurs in inert gases and our nonpolar molecules. We've looked at dipole-dipole, which occurs in molecules with a polar. And then we've looked at hydrogen bonding, where hydrogen is directly bonded to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. This is acetone, which is commonly found in nail polish remover. It's a member of the ketone family. There are three carbons represented with black, some hydrogen sticking off, and at the center of this molecule we have a carbon-oxygen double bond. This exhibits dispersion. It has a That's swell. <laughs> You'll edit that, right? Sure. Very good. <laughs> Uh, this exhibits dispersion forces. It has electrons. Did you uh, think that it has a dipole-dipole interaction? Yep, it sure does. We have a negative portion of the molecule up here where the oxygen and lone pair of electrons, two lone pairs, and the positive portion. And did you say hydrogen bonding? It actually does not exhibit hydrogen bonding. We have some of the criteria. We have lots of hydrogen atoms, six of them, but they're not bonded directly to the electronegative oxygen. The hydrogens are directly, directly bonded to the carbons. We don't have a situation where we have an extremely polar bond. The electronegativities of carbon and hydrogen are very similar. Some inert gases and in small molecules have extremely low boiling points. It's estimated that helium boils at about 4 Kelvin, very, very low because of very little interaction with one another. These polar molecules, this one is a gas at room temperature and pressure. It has good interaction, but we're at a significant temperature here. You know, room temperature is, uh, what, about 298 Kelvin, which is significant, has a significant amount of energy. Even some of these will go into the gas phase. Water evaporates, but not readily. If we put a puddle of water down, it sticks around for some time. Alcohols evaporate a little bit more readily. Let me do a little demonstration with some alcohol. I brought in a bottle of methanol. Methanol is very similar to ethanol. There's an M in front, so it's a little different. Methanol has the OH group attached to CH3. So you could think about it as being this molecule up on the board, but take out a CH2 group in the middle. And so methanol is CH3OH. I'll put some in these Frankenstein-looking jugs. We put these together a few years ago. The tape is just for effect. And we have a couple of nails that we shot through the sides of these uh, containers. Right now, I know that the methanol is starting to evaporate. We have some. Uh, gaseous molecules of methanol inside the container. Let me take a few corks and put them on top of the containers here. There we go. And the idea of this little demo is to show you that we do have a gas phase. The nails are shot into the sides of the container here, and they're separate by maybe about, oh, half an inch, maybe about a centimeter. And if I go ahead and bring a spark up to this, the spark will be transferred into the container and we'll have a spark and that could detonate the methanol. We'll give this one a try. Put on some safety glasses and hit some lights. That was a nice one. Wow, 